the, the book looks at uh, every region of the globe, uh, save Antarctica and the Arctic. We uh, left uh, those two out. The book was already long enough uh, as it was. But um, just, to, uh, just to draw your uh, attention to, uh, uh, to some of the, uh, the regional chapters, the chapters on Africa, I think, uh, are particularly noteworthy uh, because um, uh, certainly in the case of West Africa, they stress the increasing role of illicit economies, drugs, and gangs that uh, are shaping the security challenges uh, in that region and um, uh, are also, uh, also have a very important transnational dimension. Um, we have a number of chapters uh, that look at uh, security challenges in Central America and the Caribbean. One of our authors is here, John Graham, who wrote the, uh, uh, one of the chapters on uh, uh, Central America and South America. And, and what you find is that uh, the, uh, uh, those drug cartels tend to play in more than one neighborhood. The response tends to be largely, and the impacts tend to be at the local level, but it's a transnational problem that requires uh, clearly uh, the mobilization of capacity in more than one uh, neighborhood. Um, there, uh, uh, there are chapters on uh, the Middle East, uh, some very interesting chapters on the Middle East, um, which uh, uh, were written uh, before the Arab Spring uh, erupted but uh, are still, I think, very prescient in terms of their uh, outlook on uh, the kind of collective conflict management response uh, we're seeing uh, in that neighborhood uh, to those, uh, to those uh, challenges. Um, there are three very interesting chapters uh, that look at the security challenges of uh, Southeast Asia. And what they uh, point to is that this is a region uh, or part of the globe that is increasingly defining its own approaches to internal conflict management. Uh, adaptation of what some refer to as the ASEAN way and obviously a growing consciousness of the region's increasingly important uh, international role. The book uh, does try to uh, shed some light on uh, the connections between uh, these different regional landscapes, um, the different levels of conflict management uh, response uh, to those security threats, the regionally diverse definitions of security, and the reasons behind divergent regional preferences uh, for conflict management uh, in uh, those neighborhoods. That's enough from me. Over to you, Pamela. Great. Uh, Pamela, why don't you stay in your seat? I think we'll be more relaxing, okay. and uh, uh, we'll all just speak from where we're sitting at the moment. Great. Can you hear me? Any yep. problem hearing me? I have actually quite a loud voice. So those of you at the end, if you can't hear me, just tell me to speak up. Um, well, as Ben said, you know, we, we have, uh, we asked authors to look at their security challenges and to look at their security responses, but we were actually really interested in hearing about them, uh, from them, about their conflict management capacity. And so they're not exactly the same thing, but in this day and age where conflicts are spilling over borders to infect their entire regions, um, or where the international community is starting to, to uh, come together around some norms about intervention in cases of gross human rights abuses, really you see conflict management and security starting to, to, to kind of join hands over some issues. So we're very interested in pressing on, on this issue. It was clear to us, um, just looking around the world, uh, that there's lots and lots of regional security organizations. A lot of these regional security organizations have adopted some sort of conflict management um, mandate, maybe late in the game, but they, they're starting to adopt it and they're actually starting to, to, uh, to at least pronounce 
on conflict management issues. Um, but also, as you look around the world, do you see that a place like Europe is replete with regional organizations that have active conflict management roles and pursue them? There are other areas that have organizations. The Middle East has a number of organizations, but they don't really use them, or they haven't really used them, except on very occasional um, in very occasional circumstances. Um, and right now, we're watching the Arab League try to engage um, in Syria with very mixed results, I probably have to say. but. Um, so we were left with this question. This is not the main part of the book, but I think it's kind of an interesting thing to talk about is, you know, what motivates a region to become active in conflict management? Or what impedes a region from becoming active in conflict management? What, you know, what are the motivations here? And, uh, you know, as a, as a threesome, we've done quite a lot of work on motivations when it comes to engaging in, in mediation or other conflict management activities. We've looked at why states get involved, why the UN gets involved. Um, we've looked at why why NGOs. What are NGOs doing in this in this um, in this environment? What are these important individuals taking time off in their retirement to go off and do conflict management? Why are they doing this? And I think we have a really, um, you know, a fairly good understanding of what is motivating all these different kinds of groups. So we thought, not being regionalists ourselves, how hard could this be? We'll just look at the regions and we'll figure out what's motivating them and what stops them in one case and what promotes them in another. Well, we learned a lot uh, through this book. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that there is not necessarily agreement in the region on what the region is. So there, it's very rare that you can look at any region and actually be completely confident that you have gotten all the countries that belong in that region or that you haven't included some countries that some people in the region think shouldn't be there. Um, I'm in the Middle East. So where does it start and where does it end? As I was going through some maps, I noticed some maps in the Middle East don't include Egypt. Well, you know, in my mind it includes Egypt, but obviously in somebody's mind it doesn't. You know, what about Turkey? You know, how does Turkey play into this? You know, are we talking about the greater Middle East? Are we talking about Southwest uh, Asia? Okay, so what is that region? Europe. I mean, Europe's really interesting. I think we all have a feeling we know what Europe is. But of course, Europe has been expanding towards the east. Um, so are you European if you're part of the European Union? Are you European if you use the euro? What happened to Britain in that case? Um, what about Norway? Yeah, obviously European, but on, on what basis? So we figured, we, we understood. You couldn't really tell what, it, what a region was. Um, as Ben was saying, the regional organizations um, really come in every size and shape, and we just found it was very, very hard to make generalizations looking at re regional organizations. And finally, regions, even if they are acting in concert on some conflicts, seem to ignore other conflicts that are happening in their regions. So, you know, what, what, what determines when you'll pick to engage? If, again, going back to Europe, Europe tried uh, early on and not successfully, but did try to engage uh, with Bosnia, but was very much more hands off when it comes to Northern Ireland. So, you know, what explains how, how you how you uh, pick what you're going to engage on? So we. Um, we looked for factors, and and uh, we came up with uh, four factors, and probably their reverse, in determining whether you would or would not see robust regional uh, conflict management strategies. One was um, economic interdependence, a habit of economic interdependence, and I say a habit of because. It really depended on comfortable relationships among countries that really came out of trade and more functional kinds of cooperation. Um, not necessarily high political cooperation, but functional cooperation. 
democratic norms, being used to bargaining, being used to compromising, being used to not always getting your way. Um, Patterns of cooperation that might grow out of the trade relations, but might grow out of negotiations on matters of common interest, like uh, combating piracy or sharing water. And then the presence of international or, or regional uh, institutions, which gave regions a place to practice their cooperation. There was actually a, a, a functioning place where you could go and, and, and um, uh, talk about your issues. Um, what impedes the, the uh, cooperation was really, as I said, basically the reverse. Low level of economic uh, integration. And this wasn't just because they didn't have kind of a, a, a pattern of talking to each other. It's just that there was almost no cost to not cooperating. They weren't going to lose anything. You know, they weren't breaking trade relations. Um, autocratic regimes or um, sovereignty addictions, they were, um, these areas still guarded their uh, sovereignty with, with great ferocity and, and felt that any, any uh, giving up, any compromise over sovereignty issues was a great weakening of the state. And during regional rivalries, which meant that anything that your neighbor got, you lost. Really a zero-sum way of looking at your region. Um, and then uh, not having the institutions there to provide a place to, to um, have the negotiations. So these are really pretty straightforward lists, you know, economics, politics, you know, patterns of, of cooperation, etc. Um, but they didn't really seem to explain fully why regions uh, cooperate on conflict management. Um, you know, if you look at the list, you fully expect Europe to be filled with its regional organizations, which it does have. But you would also predict that Africa wouldn't have any, and Africa has plenty. So we came back to this issue again and, um, and really uh, focused, and I'm just going to jump to the conclusion here, really started focusing on culture. And if we didn't know anything much about regions, we, well, you knew a lot about regions, but I will say that Penn and I were probably uh, less familiar with deep regional studies. Um, we know a lot less about culture, but we started to understand that these habits of cooperation were actually building a culture of cooperation. So, and culture is a very tricky word to throw around because nobody really knows what it means unless you're an anthropologist, and, and, and we're not. But it is um, similar attitudes, it's similar analyses of what the problems are, uh, similar ways of viewing the world. And uh, what we saw are in, in regions in which there was cooperation, and looking at Africa is, is one of them, you had a, a culture growing where there were some similarities on, in terms of analysis, some similarities in terms of response. So um, what we have come down to at the uh, end of the study is that um, we need to start again. You know, this isn't where the conversation should, should end. In fact, um, looking around this room, um, maybe some of you would like to either pick it up or, or educate us in terms of, of um, the role that culture plays in, in regional identity. But uh, that we actually have to spend a lot more time looking at that. <coughs> ephemeral culture to really understand why regions cooperate. Thanks so much, Pamela. Chet, over to you for a few minutes, and then we'll go out to those in the room. Good. Well, a lot has been said and put in front of you uh, by my, my two colleagues uh, with great, uh, great eloquence uh, about different chapters in this book. This book has a number of chapters. It has a set of framing chapters at the beginning look kind of across the entire world spectrum uh, at issues like culture and look at differentiators that uh, help explain why some regions are more richly endowed with regional security architecture than others, for example. And then it has a whole sequence of uh, chapters written by regional authors 
who are authors from the regions about their own regions and the way they think about, uh, <clears throat> about security and how they think about conflict management. And then at the end, we have a, a sort of a summing up chapter, which introduces a concept that I will speak to briefly, which uh, Fenn alluded to, and that is the concept of collective conflict management. Collective conflict management is something distinct from collective defense or collective security. It is a, a pattern of response to challenges, security challenges, that is voluntaristic. No one forces you to do it. It is ad hoc. It tends to be in relation to specific threats or specific challenges that arise. It is spontaneous. It doesn't have a building like uh, the building at UN headquarters in New York. It doesn't have a treaty in most cases. It is not treaty-based. It is based on the interest of those who participate. And those who participate include, uh, as Pamela was suggesting, regional security organizations. But it also includes the UN system. It includes the world's most powerful and important alliance, NATO. It includes the business community on some cases. It includes the civil society sector. It includes eminent persons of different kinds. I mean, just to think, <clears throat> I mentioned an eminent person. We can all think of our favorite eminent person. My favorite eminent person is Marty Adesari, who managed to link his peacemaking in Aceh in Indonesia to the EU. So Marty did the negotiating that brought together the GAM and the government of Indonesia. But he recognized that he, Marty, and the, the conflict, uh, the crisis management initiative which he created were not capable of carrying out the implementation of his agreement. So he reaches out to the EU and the EU fields military monitors. So it's a kind of a, an alliance of different kinds, very different kinds of actors. Um, so as I said, this is something, it's a phenomenon. We're not advocating it. We're not trying to sell you some new brand of security soap. That isn't the purpose of, of this final chapter. What we're doing is observing what's actually happening in the world. And in just one minute or two, let me throw a couple of examples out. I've just given you one, which was the way uh, the Aceh conflict uh, finally was resolved. Um, <clears throat> I think, for example, of what the new US um, combatant command called AFRICOM uh, is doing to help capacity building and empowering of partner militaries across the Sahel in Central and West Africa. Um, and to do so in partnership, whether it's acknowledged or not, in partnership with the African Union and with ECOWAS, the West African Regional Organization, to do what? To isolate and go after bad guys and bring them to justice. AFRICOM is doing something quite similar in empowering the African Union presence in Mogadishu. Um, so that's a very ad hoc thing. Whether it will last, who knows? But it's an example. Another example of a very different kind was the international response to the Haitian earthquake, which could have produced and, and risked producing not only human security challenges, but, but actual conflict in the country. And if you look at who was involved in that response, it was this organization that Pamela knows more about than, than I do, Mushahidi which is based at uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. It's a graduate student run uh, uh, technology enabled capacity to do mapping and to be able to inform people about where things are turning hot and where things are turning bad at particular places in particular times. It's a technique that's been used for election monitoring. It's also used for civil disturbances, any number of things. The US Coast Guard could not have functioned in Haiti without Usha Haiti. So I mean, that's a fact. So you have this alliance between a civil society NGO, uh, graduate student-led, and, and, and the US Coast Guard and the UN, and so forth. Other quick examples I would mention, uh, the role of the Arab League serving as a gatekeeper to enable 
the UN to pass a resolution. Without the Arab League, the UN couldn't have passed the resolution that passed on Libya, which then in turn led to the handoff to NATO to do what happened in, in, in Libya. Whatever you think about that, that's the way it happened. It was collective conflict management. Um, I see other examples. Uh, there, there's cooperation in the struggle against criminal trafficking in the Balkans. There is cooperation um, of different kinds of actors, eminent persons, NGOs, that finally brought about this terrific breakthrough in the Basque conflict in Spain that just took place. So again, ladies and gentlemen, what, what I am describing is not uh, some new brand of product from Procter & Gamble's. What I'm describing to you is reality. And it has problems. It has some potential drawbacks. There are some caveats here that we need to, need to be aware of. There are some, some situations that raise issues. There may be a, a shortage of people who are good at that kind of lateral networking. There may be issues related to the kind of ephemeral quality of some of this cooperation. It's here today, is it gone tomorrow? How durable is this pattern? Well, I guess we're, it's a little bit early to, to tell the answer to that. Um, there are a lot of issues related to the extent to which external powers should be or should not be part of this process. The fact that it's not treaty-based raises interesting questions of accountability. Accountability to whom? We've run this, all of us do some teaching and training in our different lives. We've run this concept before students, student audiences, and we get very interesting and, and differentiated uh, responses and reactions. And we run it by other audiences of, of accomplished professionals like you in this room. So I'm going to shut up at this point, and we'll open it up. <laughs> well, thank, uh, thank you very much. Three of our guests. There are two microphones in the room. If those wanting to intervene would introduce themselves, uh, I was just going to note that there are some problems that are being addressed not at all in a regional way. Um, and Chet mentioned one of them earlier today in another forum, and that is the piracy uh, problem in the uh, waters off Somalia, well beyond Somalia, uh, including the Indian Ocean, which has helpfully drawn in countries like India and China that don't usually operate together uh, in uh, military uh, contexts. Uh, so that would be one. Another, uh, which was also mentioned earlier today, Afghanistan is a country that is part of several regions, as they're perceived by the neighbors, part of South Asia, part of the broader Middle East, part of Central Asia. And while everybody realizes that a solution requires active cooperation of uh, Afghanistan's neighbors, it's been nearly impossible to come up with a forum that brings them together constructively to uh, work for Afghanistan's benefit rather than the uh, self-interest of the neighboring states. Uh, so these are some of the paradoxes one comes across. Sir, please. I'm Ambassador Musa Muhammad, uh, the Jeddah Affairs of Sudan in Canada. I thank you very much. I think it is a, a very interesting and uh, a subject which I have discussed in this book. And it is, I, I, I think it is uh, always should, this anything related with the conflicts was the regional or international is we always find it uh, a subject of, of the hour because the conflicts will never end since the people and these human beings are uh, above the uh, earth the, and, and, and from this, this stems the importance of uh, your uh, very important uh, book uh, it is very complicated this issue and I um, as uh, from Africa and the Middle East, both I, according to our experiences, which are in fact uh, Africa and the Middle East have a big portion, unfortunately, in these uh, regional conflicts. So we have uh, a lot of experience. 
Uh, what I see in general that the, 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 the from our ex experiences, but including especially my country, Sudan, uh, that the, the, the best uh, mechanism for this conflict management, <coughs> the regional conflict management, is to be left for the uh, regional organizations. And uh, fortunately, it is stipulated in the United Nations Charter, this uh, role of the regional organizations in the conflicts and other things, economic cooperation and everything. And uh, but I, not just for me, according to our experience and what I think, not just the, the regional, it starts with the sub-regional. For instance, in Africa, uh, according to the experience which many of you may agree with me in that, if you leave uh, a regional conflict to the sub-regional, for instance, EGAD in the East, East Africa, or uh, ECOWAS in Western Africa, or SADC in Southern Africa, to be more effective than the African Union itself the regional, because these are the sub-regionals uh, under the umbrella of the regional or the continental uh, organization, i.e. the African Union. Ambassador, thank you for the comments. Uh, and we'll come back to them on the panel. Is that the essence of what you want to say? Because there are others who need to have access the to the The essence microphone. is that this is what, we, what, according to experience, this should be, what, what should be. Uh, the most effective is the sub-regional, then the regional, but they should not be left without a support for the international community, mainly the United Nations, especially financially, logistically, and even politically in a way that will not contribute to complicating the problems. Thank On the you. contrary, facilitating and helping and supporting the regional and the sub-regional uh, organizations to uh, manage the conflict. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Please, uh, Craig, go ahead. We'll take a few interventions and come back to them. Uh, yes, Craig Hunter with the Canadian International Council here in Ottawa. And my question uh, has some connection to the ambassador's question. As I note, a progression over the 20th century from uh, hegemonic security arrangements uh, to maybe a brief period when people expected the UN to take charge. And then during the remarks from the three of you, when the UN was only mentioned once. And uh, it does seem when you look at uh, conflict and problems occurring now that the UN gets mentioned uh, sometimes to uh, allow some legitimacy. Uh, and then people go off and start looking after it one way or the other by themselves. So I'm being interested in your your comments as you've done this research as to the place that you saw the UN in the evolving system. And if things change, is there a higher role for it? And just to emphasize this, I note that two of the uh, P5 in the Security Council, Russia and especially China now, seem to be taking a more, certainly China, more active role uh, in things and interest uh, elsewhere as well as other of the large economic powers. So how can, where, where will the U.S. Uh, or the U.N. end up uh, as things go forward in this? Well, thank you very much. And the ambassador raised the important point of the UN as a mobilizer of financial resources sometimes for uh, organizations of uh, less wealthy regions. But can the UN simply be a piggy bank for the regions, I wonder? Please. Hi, my name is Doretta Charles. I work with Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development on sustainable development issues. Now forgive me, I haven't read the book yet, so if you've covered this topic already, I'll, I'll go back and read the book. But um, I was just thinking about uh, the increase in social networking sites and internet-based sites like that, that um, that allows just, I guess, any person to be able to communicate and get in touch with someone in another country very easily. 
I was just wondering um, what impact these social networking sites have had on regional security issues and the ability for the international community to respond to regional issues. Thanks. Over to the editor. We'll start off. Go ahead. Uh, question. Um, the, uh, the reaction uh, to uh, collective conflict management is not uh, terribly enthusiastic among uh, UN devotees and UN watchers because uh, they typically view uh, the UN uh, not as uh, the, uh, the operating room as of last resort, as uh, Chet likes to refer to it, but as uh, general hospital for all cases. And um, uh, you know, our observation is that, that, and it really is an observation, uh, and it's empirically borne out uh, in many chapters of the book, uh, plus a number of other cases that we uh, identify in the conclusion, that, that uh, you know, conflict management and security management in today's world is, uh, is a hodgepodge. And it's a bit like uh, you know, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. There are lots of different actors sitting around the table. Uh, uh, and uh, they all look very, very different. But they, uh, uh, they share a, a commitment to uh, dealing with a particular problem, whether it's uh, piracy uh, off uh, the coast of Somalia, which involves a whole constellation of actors, including, by the way, local actors, uh, uh, very local actors, uh, villagers who uh, 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 you know, are unhappy about uh, uh, what's happening with the local economy uh, as a result of uh, pirates uh, 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 you know, operating and, and working out of uh, local villages. Um, but um, uh, you know, if you, uh, the, the case of, the case of uh, uh, Aceh or even if you go back to some of the, the earlier cases, uh, uh, the negotiation of the Mozambican Peace Accords, which uh, began uh, with uh, a small NGO uh, working uh, alongside uh, uh, the US State Department to bring the parties uh, to the table uh, in that conflict. In that sense, it's not new CCM, but we're seeing a lot more of it. And, and I think uh, what's, uh, what's striking about it uh, you know, is, uh, for many years, uh, the world was led from above. Um, President Obama talks about leading from behind. But we see a lot of leading from below, uh, where the, the initiative is taken uh, either by non-state actors or by uh, sub-regional actors who, uh, who are the first to step up to the plate, uh, who, who show entrepreneurial leadership, and in many cases, not all, but in many cases, reach out to a much wider constellation of actors, which, by the way, includes the UN. Okay, um, uh, uh, the UN is not absent from this story. Uh, it's sometimes a principal actor, but it's not the only actor. And and, and uh, uh, you know, the interesting question is, you know, what creates these incentives for cooperation? Pamela alluded to the fact there are new habits of cooperation forming. Uh, uh, and it tends to be driven, as we've said repeatedly, from below, not from above. Um, is this the wave of the future? We don't know. Does it have problems? You bet. But what does it tell us? It tells us one thing that I think is really important. It's entrepreneurial leadership that tends to, der tends to drive successful ventures in collective conflict management. There's, there's a vacuum of leadership out there. And those who are prepared to step up to the plate uh, can often have it uh, a very positive effect. Canada, by the way, and we do refer to a Canadian story in this book, has played a very important but quiet role bringing together Afghanistan and Pakistan to discuss what you would call soft security border management issues in something that used to be called the Dubai process until our forces got kicked out of Dubai. 
and uh, now perhaps should be called the Kuwait process or something else. But, but, but you know, Canada wasn't doing border management dialogue with Afghans and Pakistanis by itself. It was working with UN agencies that were dealing with problems at the border, many of the specialized agencies of the UN. Uh, it was working with uh, other ISAF partners. It was working with the European Union and working with countries like Germany and groups like the G8 that are prepared to write checks so that you can have better customs facilities and border management facilities at, as places like Torum, Torkum and, and other key transit points uh, along the Afghan-Pakistan border. The Dubai process is a good example of Canadian leadership in con uh, collective conflict management, right? But what does it tell you? It tells you that you got to be prepared to step up to the plate. There's an opportunity there if you do. Great. Pamela? Um, I'll take on the question uh, about social networking because it is a very interesting one and one I think that we will get more and more um, as we start to understand the power of this tool. Um, if it is, is indeed a tool. I mean, it's hard to say what social networking is because it is a, a communication device. And it is important to note that as a communication device, it can be used by anyone. Mm -hmm. So you can have very positive results out of social networking, and you can have um, really terrifyingly horrible results out of a communication device, including social networking. But um, it, it, it predates the Arab Spring, and I'm just thinking about the, the lessons we learned a little bit about the contagion of revolutions in, in, um, uh, from the Balkans to Central Asia, um, where you had that series of colored revolutions. Um, but it seemed that they actually were learning from each other. So that was before. Um, Twitter and 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 but it was after the discovery of the internet, um, so it was quite easy to um, develop these uh, techniques of overthrowing dictators through nonviolent uh, civil resistance, and you saw it in Serbia, and then you saw it in a number of other places um, after that. So that that was clear learning a technique through communication devices of some sort. We obviously saw it, um, the, the um, vast increase uh, of communications at the ground level during the Arab Spring movements all over um, the Middle East. Right now, I, I have to say I worry a, a little bit uh, about what the dynamics might be, and I, I'm beginning to think that the best sort of formula is a combination of social networking and international resolve um, to back the, the, either the promotion of democracy or the protection of human rights that the social networking may be putting out there, um, pressuring their governments. Because governments still have a very nasty way of hitting back. And um, so I do think we have to think carefully about how we support local movements to change governance. Um, if the international community, whoever that is, and we all know we don't know who it is, but the international community <laughs> um, uh, shows something more than moral support, it probably will be much more effective. If we simply say, isn't it great Everybody, it, it, the world's getting more democratic, and we applaud it. I worry about what happens to people in Nazi <laughs> countries when their governments turn against them. I can't help where, where Pamela developed that story, because <clears throat> I think we quite often observe uh, these uh, social activists using the modern social networking technologies, we see them out there, we see them getting interviewed on Al Jazeera's English service or, or on BBC or, or, or CNN or whatever. 
and we look at them and we say, hey, they speak English just like, just like we do. And, and they wear blue jeans just like we do, so they must be good. And, and that's a problem because street power is not necessarily always a force for democracy. It may be a force for settling old scores or starting new ones. So we have to be a little bit aware of how, as Pamela said, this technology can be used for all kinds of purposes. I just want to pick up on the point about sub-regionals, which the ambassador raised very quickly. Um, I, think, I think you're right. I think sub-regionals often are where the traction is and where the level of interest is highest in its development. There is a downside, which is that sometimes the sub-regionals are captured by hegemons. And so who is really running the sub-regional entity may be a, a question that some people raise. If they, if they look at ECOWAS initiatives in Sierra Leone, they're saying, well, now, who is that really? Who's behind the curtain? Is this Nigeria, or is it Senegal, or is it Ghana? Um, so you, you have those kinds of, of issues that, that relate. Fenn made a, a fascinating point about uh, things being driven from below, and I think he's absolutely right. It's interesting, if you look at the example of the Arab League role in creating the intervention possibility in Libya, which may or may not ever be replicated in Syria. The Arab League was indispensable. Without it, there could not have been a UN resolution. But without a UN resolution, you couldn't have had a NATO intervention. And so I asked myself this question, whose idea was it to link all this together? <laughs> do, we, do we really think that diplomats and leaders in different capitals we're not speaking to each other? I, I, somehow I don't think so. I have a sneaking suspicion that there might have been some lateral networking which gets to the basic issue of who's capable of running this very ill-organized, spontaneous machinery. It's a limited number. David, you must jump well, in here. Uh, actually, I wanted to come back to uh, Pamela's point, and we'd invite any others wanting to intervene to come up to the microphone. I'll be brief. Uh, uh, as a young man, I lived through the bread riots in Egypt in January 1977, which mobilized many more people on the streets of Cairo than uh, the Egyptian spring has so far. And those were mobilized without any help from social media. Uh, as well in uh, Egypt, what we've seen is that people who use social media are still very much a minority within society, whereas people who look at Al Jazeera are the majority of Egyptians. Jazeera has been arguably, and Arabia and some others, much more effective in terms of getting information across uh, than the generally highly agitated uh, social uh, media uh, users. So I think it's very easy to get carried away by means of communication. Uh, I think these, uh, many of these countries were ripe for a change. So there was a ripeness in the situation that existed for change. Uh, secondly, uh, governments could no longer control information, which they had tried so hard to do in much of the Middle East quite successfully. Uh, for a long time. And now we're beginning to see that uh, in terms of outcomes of elections, the outcomes of elections aren't necessarily what the people using social media would have wished for. So I think a degree of caution is required in uh, believing that social media is at the root of everything that's happening. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, I think it's a factor amongst other factors. Monsieur, please. Uh, my name is Ferdinand Safari. I'm the defense attaché to the United States and Canada. Uh, uh, which United States and Canada. Yes. Uh, I'm from Rwanda. Ah, good. Thank yeah. You. Anyway, it, mine, I appreciate that the, this book has come out, though most of us have not got time to read it fully. <laughs> yeah, to rely just on the comments you have just given. Uh, I wish to make just the following observations. Uh, just a few, please. Not a speech of observation. No, 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 just more, yeah. 
it is uh, really uh, an observation that uh, digital organization may not do much uh, in terms of security and conflict management. And uh, uh, I appreciate somebody who said that AFRICOM is building capacity of Africans, and I do appreciate for that, because really uh, that's the way to go. But sometimes we want a quick fix. You build capacity today, and tomorrow you want somebody to do something, which I think it is not. you need some people to mature and to give them time to really internalize that capacity. That's what I think. This is one observation I'm making. I remember uh, in the year 2004, I was part of the African Union mission to Darfur. And uh, I believe that was in the regional context, the African Union. And then if we see what is happening now in Somalia, it is only two African countries that are participating in the peacekeeping. So I believe that there is really a, a light of hope, given time. If you can just give time to regional organization to mature and to internalize the, that capacity you are giving. Thank you very much. Uh, for that. Um, a, a comment from me and a question perhaps to our panelists uh, before we conclude. Uh, we've spoken a great deal about Africa, and rightly so, a little bit about the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, it, a great deal of attention is nowadays focused on Asia, and I think uh, necessarily so. It's where a great deal of the economic growth is taking place in the world today. It's where a great deal of the population uh, of the globe today uh, lives. And for a very long time, Asians were tentative about organizing themselves in uh, uh, subcontinental organizations, perhaps for fear of offending another country in the region, perhaps because they saw some countries saw other countries as uh, pawns of this superpower or that superpower uh, at the time. Today, we seem to see a rush towards various experimental techniques at regional organization in uh, Asia. And I wanted to ask you as editors what, what your thoughts were coming away from your project, because you have a number of very interesting chapters on Asia. And what have you, as editors, concluded from them? Um, I think uh, Asia, the part of Asia I know, I'll be quite frank with South East Asia, and um, where you see, I think, um, you know, perhaps the oldest uh, of the Asian uh, regional organizations, uh, but you also see an articulation of what I was talking about before, the culture, the culture of conflict management. Um, That's right. You have a non-confrontational, to the point of uh, a at times ignoring um, conflicts that would cause problems uh, for the region. I have to say, um, in, in in looking at how South Asia has progressed, and it has, it may have been little bit by little bit, Southeast Asia um, has progressed. Um, it, it has, in fact, moved its conflict management ability forward so that um, issues that were never addressed before are starting to be addressed. Um, I think they're still very aware of the, um, the conflicts that run across borders in Southeast Asia. So for them to address these issues takes uh, also a great deal of diplomacy. And I'm thinking about the role that Malaysia has uh, played as the mediator of choice in the Philippines uh, Mindanao conflict. Um, it hasn't been comfortable for any of the parties particularly, but they've never given up 
that role. And Malaysia, after all these years, maintains its role in that uh, conflict. And I think just that persistence of hanging on and giving the example that uh, regional organization can, or re a, a regional, you know, a neighbor can play a role, um, has been very positive. Um, Indonesia has shown a much greater understanding of the power of gently um, playing a role in, in its region. So I think it's changing there. Um, but that that is uh, coming from someone who has bought a, a you know a fairly superficial knowledge uh, of the region. And, and to build on that for a second, if I could, before coming back to Chet and uh, Fen. Um, we in the West were convinced that Western sanctions on Burma were helpful in uh, uh, making stark uh, options available to uh, the Burmese regime. And that's probably true. ASEAN argued all along that keeping some lines open to Burma was absolutely necessary, and that's probably true. So it's not that every actor relating to a crisis needs to be doing exactly the same thing or singing from the same hymn book. It seems to me that both those dynamics were helpful each in their own way. Chet? I think East Asia experience tends to demonstrate a point that Pamela made at the outset, which is the difficulty of defining a region. And that's really what the arguments have been about when it comes to East Asian security mechanisms and fora, was one big power saying, we don't really want outsiders to be involved in this, so let's not have the US invited. Or another one saying, well, are the Australians really part of East Asia? Or another saying, well, if we're going to have the Americans, we've got to have the Russians. So before you know it, uh, East Asian security mechanisms are getting larger and larger and larger. But what I find really fascinating right now is the, <clears throat> the very aggressive effort, and I, I use that terminology intentionally, of the current American administration, uh, not just to pivot, which is the wrong word, but to rebalance and to demonstrate that we are determined to rebalance and to reassert the validity of our bilateral defense treaties with key partners in East Asia. A, and B, we're determined to maintain open access, uh, freedom of the seas for what are the most important maritime highways in the world. We're going to do it. And we're going to do it in a way that's going to balance ASEAN's capacity so that ASEAN can stand up to the Chinese. That's what it's all about. So there's a, a terrific amount of dynamism going on out there. It's, it's, a, it's a laboratory. Can? Uh, one, one of the things that really uh, pops out at you in the book is it's quite clear from the Asian chapters that the way security threats are perceived is the, in, in the old-fashioned way, uh, uh, namely uh, great power uh, rivalries and, and uh, hegemonic assertions in the region. That's very different from Africa, where the human security template tends to travel much more strongly in terms of threat perceptions. Um, now, that, that view may not be shared by you know, every Asian whether of the Southern or East Asian variety specialists, but certainly those who contributed to this volume, China looms large. And secondly, the institutional development really has to be seen through the prism of what might be called an increasingly uh, assertive US role in offshore balancing in the region, uh, where uh, good old fashioned balance of power politics is driving some of the institutionalization and institutional responses. You know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which we've heard about a lot recently, you could say, well, yes, that's an economic me mechanism to promote economic cooperation, but it's also a balancing mechanism because China's not part of it. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Fen. And come back to uh, Burma for a second. Um, Burma, uh, as a result of uh, factors you all know, became exceptionally reliant on China uh, for investment, for economic activity. It suited the Chinese. It seemed to su suit the Burmese. But then we saw recently this assertive effort by the government of Burma 
to try to break out of isolation. Uh, so in effect, there was a balance of power exercised by the government of Burma also. It just became too much China, although China had been good for those in power in Burma, too much of it was too much, it seems. And so a balance of power plays out in all sorts of ways in continents like Asia and elsewhere. And um, none of us know exactly how uh, events in Burma or, or elsewhere in Asia will unfold. After all, that's what makes the study of international relations and for those participating in the management of them, the practice of international relations, so very interesting, it seems to me. To our audience, thank you very much for being with us. For those who intervened, thank you very much. And above all, to our guests today, thank you for being with us. Merci. À bientôt.